This is Professor Clements as we continue our study of optics, now studying wave optics instead of geometrical optics. Our previous chapters, the light was interacting with objects that were much, much larger than the wavelength. In this chapter on wave optics, the light is going to be interacting with smaller objects and there's a different behavior on how the light travels when the light does that interacts with smaller objects. So let's go ahead and launch into uh, just some uh, visuals of what this looks like. If you could hold up a DVD or CD and let the light uh, glance off of the uh, surface and you'll see a rainbow. That is not caused by inks or dyes in the CD material. As you can see, different colors come from the same spot depending on how you tilt the disc. It's a wave optics phenomenon. We're getting dispersion of light uh, in a different way than happens in a prism. Or soap bubbles have a wave optics nature to them that we'll go over. Um, here's a laser uh, being used to uh, create a system that works with adaptive optics. Um, a little bit misleading here. This laser is not causing the Milky Way here to glow. Uh, the light, of course, stops in our atmosphere. Um, but it's uh, useful in this laser light. We'll use lasers in lab. If we send the laser through uh, openings that are regularly spaced, we'll see uh, this interference and diffraction pattern on the screen. We'll explain what that is. But the number of bright spots you, you see down here is not equal to the number of openings that the light is going through. So uh, here's an example of this with yellow light, not a laser light, but yellow light. And it's going through just two openings. There are only two openings that the light is uh, passing through. Uh, one of the early theories on light was that it was particles, uh, kind of like bullets coming out of a gun. And another theory was light consists of waves. So what does this uh, observation indicate about the nature of light? <clears throat> well, it indicates light travels as a wave, as we'll uh, come to understand. And there's constructive and destructive interference of those waves occurring in this uh, situation. To kind of uh, get a flavor of this, Huygens had a method of ray tracing or following the flow of energy of uh, waves. So we have a wave peak here, and every point along the wave can be considered to be an emitter of light. And a little semicircle drawn out here equal to the distance light would travel in a certain time. And then the boundary, the envelope of all these semicircles is the location of the wavefront at some later time. Uh, another drawing of it here, uh, either with a flat wavefront or with a curved wavefront, same principle applies. At each point along the wavefront, you draw a semicircle centered on that point, and the size of that, uh, uh, or the, the gap across here, the size of the radius, is equal to velocity times time. So uh, Huygens' principle is kind of tedious. We're not going to draw things that way, but it helps us understand something like this. When light comes in through a small opening, uh, it does not cast sharp shadows. Uh, we do not see straight edge shadows for light goes through a small opening. We do see a sharp shadow to our eye when light goes through a doorway or a window. That's uh, because the wavelength of the light is too small. But if we get a situation where the wave is bigger, let's take a sound wave. That's much bigger than a light wave. Sound wave going through a door. You do not have to be standing in front of the door opening directly. You can be back away down the hallway and you will hear someone talking uh, in the room. Part of that is from the reflection of sound, but another part of it is diffraction. Diffraction. This energy spreads out. You can think of little uh, semicircles being emitted here on the wavefront that's in the doorway, and some of this energy goes off at an angle that is not straight ahead. That's a wave phenomenon that we're going to study in this chapter. Uh, little uh, further drawings on this where the opening's getting smaller as we go to the right. And we're seeing a little bit of bending of energy here in a big opening. More bending of energy, it's more significant in terms of the total length of the wave here. 
And then if we get a really small opening, we will get these expanding spheres of energy, just showing circles here, uh, but spheres of energy coming from that opening. And again, this is diffraction. Uh, when uh, a wave passes through an opening that is somewhat comparable to the wavelength, then we do not get a sharp beam coming through. Instead, there is energy that comes off to the side. That's diffraction. Um, so Young's double slit experiment in the early 1800s, um, if we can use a filter and create just one wavelength of light, uh, say red or blue or green, and then let that light go through two openings, what we observe on a screen is that there are interference patterns, uh, places where the waves from the two openings uh, line up together, constructively interfere, and places where a peak and a valley of the waves, the two waves arrive at the same time, at the same point, and they cancel each other. This was proof that the uh, uh, wave, that light was a wave, not a particle. If it was a particle, we would just get two bright spots for the particles going through these two openings. Instead, we get multiple bright spots. There's a little another diagram of this, set up two openings here, and there will be multiple bright slots on the screen back here. Though so Young's double slit experiment showed conclusively that light travels as a wave. Um, so here's a little animation of this as the wave comes in, going through the two openings, we get these circles coming out. Uh, where the peaks overlap, we get uh, constructive interference, we get a bright spot, and where the uh, a peak and a valley line up, we get a dim spot. So here are two waves that are in constructive interference arrangement. Peak and peak line up, valley and valley line up, we get a bigger amplitude wave. If we have peak lining up with valley, then these waves add to zero. There's a zero line going through the middle here, plus above it, minus below it. And in that situation, uh, we can have a plus amount of amplitude here, a minus amount of amplitude here. If these are the same amplitude waves, then they'll add to zero. Destructive interference. Uh, going through the double slit, uh, if we take the paths over to what I'm labeling minimum here, the dark spot on the screen, um, the paths and I'm fighting this a little bit, that the path from here and from here, these two are the same length, and from here and here out to the screen, those are the same length. There's an extra path along the bottom here. There's a right triangle. D is the hypotenuse. There'll be a theta, an angle in here, and D sine theta would be this side of the right triangle. So D sine theta is this extra path. If this is one half of a wavelength, then we're going to get the waves out of phase. The waves are in phase. They're coherent at the, uh, at the start here, at the uh, two openings. But having an extra half wavelength, a peak and a valley will arrive together at this minimum. And a peak and a peak will arrive if they're one wavelength different from each other. If it's one extra wavelength here, when we have a peak here, then there'll be a peak here. And a peak here is they have peak and peak at the two openings. So those peaks travel together out to, the, uh, out to our target. So this screen is a long distance away from the opening. So that's why they have the kind of broken lines here. But D is the separation of the two openings. We have some extra path length delta L. If that is half of a wavelength, then if I have peak here, I'll have valley here, half a wavelength away. And peak and peak, we have coherent light coming into the two openings, though the peaks arrive at the same time at the two openings. But an extra half wavelength here will have a valley here. And now valley and peak travel the same distance out to the screen, and we get destructive interference. If delta L is a full wavelength, then we have peak and peak, peak here, and the peaks travel together and give us a bright spot out on the screen. Another view of this uh, with our uh, light going through the two openings, there is a central maximum, central maximum where theta equals zero. Then there's a first minimum, 
And then the next maximum is actually called the first order maximum. And then we have a second order, third order, and fourth order. And those go on both sides. So the central maximum here, first order maximum, second order, third order, fourth order. And uh, we'll be doing some calculations with those. So there's an equation. That's always good. D sine theta equals m lambda, so maxima. m is an integer, either 0 or 1 or 2 or 3. But this can be used to calculate the angle at which we get this bright spot on the screen, the maximum. We can also have minima. When m is a 0, then we'd have half wavelength of extra path. If remember, the d sine theta is the extra path distance down here. d is here, theta is here. d sine theta is the calculation that gives us the length of this uh, short side of the right triangle. So d sine theta is m lambda. That locates the maxima. m is 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And then the minima, the formula is just slightly different. For the formula, we have m plus a half multiplied by the wavelength. Lambda is the wavelength of the light. There'll just be a single wavelength coming through these slits when we do this calculation. But notice, you know, it, what, hap what would happen if the wavelength would change? If the wavelength would change? If the wavelength gets bigger, the theta value gets bigger. So think about where red and violet light would land on the screen. If we have red and violet light coming into these two slits, which one would have the bigger angle? Red has a bigger wavelength. Will it have a bigger angle? Now, let's go on to the next slide. So the end of day one and, and what we've been talking about here, light travels as a wave. And I'm going to uh, just bring us to this screen. Light travels as a wave. We can have constructive and destructive interference as we have two waves arriving at the screen at the same time. Uh, we have two waves. Um, this is a very big uh, issue in the 1800s, a great advance in our knowledge of light, um, proof that it did travel as a wave. Of course, that agrees with uh, Maxwell's equation of electricity and magnetism that predicted an electromagnetic wave. And that's what, uh, what light is. And, the oscillating electric and magnetic fields. It has a wavelength. But light, when it's traveling, is not particles. And just to pique your curiosity a little bit, in a future chapter, we will talk about light as if it is a particle. You know, it's a different phenomenon. Um, for, for right now, light is traveling, and we'll, uh, um, we'll know that it's a, a wave when it's traveling. Um, we haven't had to put light through a medium here to make it change directions. This wave phenomenon happens naturally when the light goes through the two openings. Uh, we get uh, the energy falling at an angle away from straight ahead, uh, not through the process of refraction, but through the process of wave constructive and destructive interference. Though we'll be doing some uh, example calculations uh, with this. Um, so the sound is uh, one place where you can hear this. Uh, if we would go outdoors on a quiet day and set up a wall with a door in it, and someone on the uh, one side of the wall speaks. A person on the other side of the wall, not in front of the doorway, um, would be able to hear that person. The sound waves will diffract through that opening. So diffraction would occur. The energy goes out at uh, in a full semicircle out of that doorway. Um, so then the concept of coherent light is an important concept. The coherent light has, our, uh, has the peaks of the wave aligned with other peaks of the wave. They're said to be in phase. We'll talk more about that when we talk about lasers. Uh, but coherent light, we have the peaks of the waves uh, aligned with each other and keeping step. And coherent light is best to use in the double slit experiment. Um, so you should be reviewing that and thinking about what calculations can take place. Um, you know, d sine theta equals m lambda for the maxima. And knowing that angle theta, I hope you noticed on the, uh, I'll go back to this drawing. Uh, but in this drawing, if we know the angle theta, 
we can anyway, go back to this one. If we know this angle theta up here in this triangle, it is the same angle down here. You could imagine, you know, turning if there's a little block of wood here and bring that back to the slits. Uh, then this dotted line would point straight ahead. So the angle inside this triangle is the same as the angle out here. If we want to calculate the distance of a bright spot away from straight ahead, then we can use again a right triangle and it's the tangent function that is appropriate. Tangent of this angle theta is equal to opposite divided by adjacent. Tangent of theta is equal to this y distance from the central maximum up to wherever we're interested in um, divided by the separation of the slit to screen distance which will usually be a big distance. Um, so we do need coherent light coming in here. If we just have random light, the waves will not be in phase coming through the slits and we won't get this effect occurring. Uh, so the demonstrations we'll use, we'll use a laser that gives us coherent light where the waves are in phase. So we'll have peak and peak arriving at the same time at these two openings. And the wave uh, interference effects will then take place and be seen easily. So I hope you're, you're reading through the textbook you're thinking about uh, uh, examples of this and uh, looking at example problems that are made available to you. Ask your instructor questions.